All right, everybody. Welcome back to Bob and Jesse Draw. This week we're going to do giant movie monsters, as you can tell by our intro graphic there. <laughs> That's really perfect. <laughs> no, I figured you would be Godzilla this morning since you got up so early. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm going to be, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be drawing Godzilla. And what are you going to be drawing? I'm going to be doing Mecha Godzilla, the alien manufactured robotic version of Godzilla. All right. Now, I, I need to just sort of premise this by saying I'm not um, a giant movie monster expert, but I did uh, watch a bunch of Godzillas when I was a kid, so I feel like that kind of goes, goes okay. From the layman's uh, perspective, I guess. Wait, we're rubber banding out here on our, on our thing. Are we? Yeah, I, I gotta, I'm gonna go in here and just uh, make sure I got everything quit out real quick. All right. Here, so, all right, I just got Photoshop and Google open, so we should be okay. All right. Anyways, you were saying? No, we, you know, I think we've already established we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna be experts in any of these subject matters necessarily, unless you want to talk about something really obscure or weird. I don't know what your thing is, but um, uh, my, my. Uh, interest in giant movie monsters is probably just like many other people's. Watched them a lot as kids on TV late at night and uh, and really like the uh, the visuals and the cool crazy movies and the giant you know monsters destroy, destroying cities and all that kind of cool stuff but uh, like any of these weird subjects and genres and I don't know what you want to call them. They call them fandoms or whatever. Now you could take yeah, it to like yeah. such a high level that everything we say is going to have to be checked with our uh, Godzilla fan <laughs> legal team before. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, man. No, so, I, you know, I just I, I I do these things as I remember them from you know from being a kid or whatever you know. So I watched a fair amount of these. I didn't watch a ton of them. Um, and I was pretty young when I used to watch them, so uh, oh, yeah. the, uh, I think um, probably the the one that I'm most familiar with would probably be Star Trek. But even there, I'm not that great with that stuff, you know. So well, you, you, there's there's other things in life that <laughs> you know there are well, like what? Yeah, imagine that. But there, <laughs> there are a few things that come up now and then. My thing though is wrestling, and one of these days we're gonna have to do wrestling as a thing because. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm i pretty sure, um, I, I don't really know all that much about wrestling, but I'm pretty sure I could have some fun with that one. I, I think anybody could. But my have, problem is I take it I take it too far. I take it to the point where it's almost like a, um, I don't know, what do you, I, I almost treat it like it's a, a subject I should be writing like my uh, thesis about. You know, <laughs> You can do what you gotta do, man. I can apply. I can apply pro wrestling to any any situation and any. In fact, one of the reasons that I sort of was sort of reintroduced to the uh, giant monsters is there's a wrestling company up in uh, New England somewhere, and I, I remember seeing them a few years ago, and they were called Kaiju Big Battle. Oh, nice. And they would dress up in these giant suits and do wrestling matches, and that was their whole sort of gimmick or whatever. The the giant monster wrestling match. And so you'd have like these little foam buildings that they built and cardboard buildings that they would put all over the ring. And they would stamp on them and destroy them and do all that kind of stuff. So it was kind of neat to kind of do see that again, but um and then uh I wasn't sure if our our theme was going to cover uh other large monster subjects. I know we got the Godzilla movies coming out soon. And yeah, yeah. Well, the well because the movie was coming out, I thought this would be kind of fun, you know. Yeah. So there's a new Godzilla movie coming out. Yeah. And it definitely is uh, benefiting, I guess, or not, I don't know if you want to call it benefiting, depending on your point of view. But um, it's definitely using all the new techniques and you know all that for the CGI and all the stuff that we just never saw in the original. Godzilla movies and yeah, they were pretty hokey, and that's what I think I love the most about them. You know, it's because even right. as a kid, you kind of recognize that. Right. You knew it was a guy in a suit, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. 
You were the yeah. guy that was looking for like their their uh, where they were looking through and stuff. Well, not so much, but not I mean not as a kid. Like I I, I was able to enjoy them as a kid, but I think when I look at those pictures, like the ones that you see, like we were looking at earlier, where they're um, uh, where the guy's in the suit, you know, and they're on the set. I love those. I think those are just the greatest thing ever. Oh, yeah. It definitely changes the whole uh, context, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. See. Somehow he was always wading through water, as I recall. He was always like... <laughs> well, they... <laughs> they had rented the they rented the studio water pool or whatever for like three days. They got to get all their shots in while they can, you know. Yeah, and then also uh, he was always like he was always like uh, pulling down uh, pulling down wires and stuff, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right, so I, I felt talk- bad for the guys that had to build all the little tanks. Oh, and they always got destroyed and stuff. Yeah. But you know, once you understand, you know, the whole idea about film. I guess it's just better off that they were used in a movie. But I used to build models as a kid, and I used to love, you know, doing all that. And I just can't imagine. You just kicked a bunch of models over, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And what happens, like, if they if they mess up the take or something? <laughs> Poor guys building all these things all over again. I don't, you know, if, if you go back and watch those movies, I, I don't think that was as big an issue for them. <laughs> The criteria for messing up a take was probably similar to what ours is for our show here. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. just go with it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't know, man. I, I used to really like those. Although the plots for those movies for, like, the last 15 years, I probably couldn't tell you what the movies were about. No, no. It was just, I mean, you, you tuned in for the destruction, right? Yeah, I mean, it was it was like pro wrestling with giant lizards for me mostly and mm-hmm. the storyline mattered very little actually uh, especially at that age and we're talking like the 70s and 80s yeah they yeah. started hitting television up until the 90s late night on the UF, UHF channels you know and uh, they were always good for watching and not really caring about stuff Oh man, I I remember you know as a kid trying to get those UHF channels too, you know, like I did. <laughs> turning that dial, click 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 click. Oh yeah, yeah, and then and then the thing on the roof would spin around, you know, the the oh. antenna on the roof would spin around, and then uh, you'd always have the vice grips, you know, <laughs> to help yeah. change the channel. Well, we had a um a TV where it would the tube would go out, and uh, we had this real heavy book, and I remember it was one of my favorite books, but it was the heaviest book we had in our house. Yeah. And we would pick the book up and drop it on the TV, and it would sort of reset the TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That I, TV lasted yeah, for years have to, working like that, though. Yeah, you have to bang the top of it. I remember we had uh, first, Jeff, um, I, I got like a converter box for the TV, you know, because it wasn't it, you plugged it into the back or whatever um, to, to retro. And uh, eventually we got the the TV that had the UHF on it, and then I remember like the, the uh, it had like the regular knob, and then it had like a little inset knob, you know, that would. That yeah, would that was UHF. the UHF channels there. Yeah, and that thing would always break, and I, I remember always my we we'd always be you know, at some point getting in touch with the TV repair guy, you know, and and that was always like, it was always high on our priority TV list. Repair guy. It was yeah, it was high on our our priority list as kids, but low on my dad's. <laughs> yeah, oh, of course. And so <laughs> we'd be bugging him all the time, Dad, Dad, when are we gonna get the TV fixed? <laughs> but uh, yeah, those are that was hilarious. I, I just think back on how how primitive that seems compared to the way that we watch TV now, you know. Yeah, it it uh, it definitely has changed. And the um, you know, back then I guess it added to the. Uh, I don't want to, the suspension of disbelief, you know, we didn't, we saw these monsters on TV, we didn't have computer generated effects just for Saturday morning cartoons and... No, and they were so, uh, the the resolution was so terrible too, it was it was ridiculous. Oh yeah, they could hide wires just because the resolution of the show was, or the filming was so low. Yeah. You know, or whatever they, I don't even know if they used the term resolution, but back then, but... Uh, Oh, it was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. But somehow it seemed to work out okay, you know? <laughs> Nobody seemed to complain too much. 
No. We used to have this little black and white TV that was like maybe six inches. Mm-hmm. And uh, we used to, I guess it was considered portable, but it weighed like 40 pounds or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we kept that in the kitchen. It was a little black and white TV. And I, I don't even, I don't think my kids have ever even seen, I think they treat black and white like it's a filter for, uh, you know, oh, that's that artsy thing that people do on uh, Instagram, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Not we, that yeah, that was a technical limitation of any kind. Uh, yeah, we had one of those old black and white ones too that that just hung around for years and years. And that was like, if 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 you got sick, in my house, uh, and and you had to be uh, in bed, you get the little black and white TV there. We'd roll that in, had a little stand, you know, like a little <laughs> wooden stand. Roll that in, you get all three. You know, inevitably, yeah. like afternoon come rolling around, you'd be watching something like Dinosaur or uh, Phil Donahue. <laughs> Oh, Phil Donahue, God. Remember that? <laughs> Remember oh. that guy? <laughs> and you always get stuck with the prices, right? For like, Oh, yeah. Well, you know, there was a, it's a, it was a weird sort of thing with that show, The Price is Right. You know, you, you, like I could decide if I if I loved it or I hated it when it used to come on. But, you know, he there, there was Bob Barker every time you got sick, you know. He was always there. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, entertainment, I never understood daytime television entertainment. I mean... Just, well, you, I mean, you remember back in the 70s and, and 80s, the 70s for you, but for me, uh, I was, I'm a little older than you. I remember that just being like the biggest um, game show years, you know? The, oh, yeah. Were really big in those days. Um, I remember watching things like uh, Match Game and, and uh, the Hollywood Squares and all those things. Remember those oh, ridiculous yeah. shows? Oh, yeah. A Price is Right was one I watched all the time. Family Feud was one we ended up watching on occasion. I can't say that it was like a, a thing the family did, but, you know, it always seemed to be on TV. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, and I remember watching um, some shows with my parents. We used to watch Laughing a lot when I was a kid. My parents never watched I don't, I just barely remember that one. I was a little bit young when for that one. But I remember watching, and then... Uh, also, in the evenings, variety shows were, were really popular back in those days. Yeah. Um, I used to watch, uh, which, what are the, oh, um, on uh, on Fridays, there was always, like, a lot of variety shows. We would watch Carol Burnett and, um, and the... Uh, Carol Burnett I watched a lot. I don't know why and, uh, I watched a lot of it, but I always liked it. Because Tim Conway was one of my favorite characters. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was great, and Harvey Corman too, right? Oh yeah, the any uh, anybody from the cast of the Apple Dumpling Gang seemed to be like my. <laughs> <they were, laughs> the Apple Dumpling. Gang. You know that movie? So, yeah, of course, of course. Tim Conway, you know that kind of uh, movie was what I really liked when I was a kid. So I don't know, that was. Uh, yeah, you don't was, see those kind of movies around much anymore. Uh, yeah. Don Knotts was a, a big favorite too. Oh yeah. But well, he was great. <laughs> so, you know, those kind of shows were always good. And I remember, see, I'm, most of my years, formative years, were probably in the 80s. And we, that was the dawn of, like, the rerun era. Yeah. So most of the shows you probably grew up with and you remember at a similar stage. I probably watched the same ones just a few years later. It, yeah, it's possible. I used to, huh. uh, I remember, like, uh, the 70s was kind of... Um, but like the truck theme was big in the 70s, you know. So like everything was about trucks, big rigs, yeah, BG and Smokey and the Bandit and all that stuff. And I remember going. Yeah, I used to love those. Yeah, I remember going to the theaters and and seeing those movies, you know. Well, uh, any movie that had a monkey in it, I was in. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. by the time I was old enough to go see those movies, um, yeah, I saw all of them. I think if it had a chimpanzee or an orangutan in it, I was I was all about that. So that was you, huh? <laughs> BJ and the Bear, and uh, and uh, what was the any which way but loose with Clint Eastwood with that orangutan? Oh yeah, with the orangutan. Yeah, left turn, Clyde. Tarzan, <laughs> any anything man. that was. Yeah. Monkey crazy. Maybe it was Planet of the Apes that did that to me. I don't know, but. Uh, I was terrified of that movie when it first came out. Oh yeah, that was. Those things looked so real for that, you know, for back then. 
Well, my I remember my family wanted to watch that. Uh, this was when it first came on TV. Remember they used to have like the the specials that would come on TV, the movie oh, of the yeah. week, you know that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. So movie of the week would come on, and it was Planet of the Apes, and I was terrified, but I had to watch it anyways, you know, because it was TV, and you get to watch TV, so you're gonna watch it. Well, it's not like you had Netflix or YouTube to go watch. No, but I remember um, when the movie came out, uh, the I was okay with it until that scene where, um, uh, well, actually, there was two. There were two of them, two scenes in there that really freaked me out. The one was when uh, they're in the cornfield, you know, and yeah. uh, and and the monk, the all the apes come in on the horseback. Oh, you know, and round everybody up. Brr, brr, yeah, running away. And <laughs> that scene freaked me out a little bit. And then the other one that freaked me out was. Um, when uh, Charlton Heston sees his buddy, you know, and he, and and, the, and he's trying to talk to him, and then and then like he turns his head, and he's got the big scar on his head. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh. That scene. That scene freaked me out. That's horrifying <laughs> for that day and age. Yeah. You damn dirty apes. <laughs> Dude, the end of that movie. Good lord. I love that. that was it was so, so just like depressing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Charlton Heston was the best. He was like the best over actor. He came from he came like the from the William Shatner school of acting. You know that kind of thing. Yeah. And I just love the way he was so over the top all the time. You know, all of his movies. He was just oh, yeah. he was great in all those. And he did all those disaster movies and stuff. Soylent Green is people. <laughs> <laughs> It's people. <laughs> yeah, well, he did some pretty depressing movies, actually. You think about it, jeez. Well, those there was a, those were the kind of movies that were going on then. Disaster movies were big, you know. Like I remember, um, what was the one? I, the first one I think I saw was Poseidon Adventure. You know, where the oh yeah. Were. And that then after that, uh, or, or probably bef- I think it was before, um, was like um, Earthquake and. Uh, with some of the other ones, Towering airport. Inferno, yeah, Airport, Airplane, Airport, was it? Yeah, Airport, because um, the Airplane were the were the ones that made fun of that. Um, but Airplane, I remember Air, Air Airport seventy five, I think was the one that I, I first saw. Right. That was, that was the first disaster movie I think I ever saw, and then Poseidon Adventure. And... All right, I'm having trouble with his head, man. Dude, <laughs> what's going on over there? <laughs> I know. Look at that. That's like a nightmare. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta get out my red pencil and start refining down a little bit here. Refining my butt? That's getting redone. <laughs> there we go. I gotta get these eyes just right. I don't know what happened there. I should put another layer on top of this. Uh, King Kong. Remember the the remake of King Kong? The seventies or eighties yeah. one? Uh, yeah, I don't think it was '80s, was it? It was it was '70s. It had well, I'm thinking it's '80s. I want to say it's '80s, but no, it had to be '70s. I'll double check that on Netflix because I think I saw it on there yesterday. I was gonna watch a Godzilla movie because I knew we were gonna be drawing giant movie monsters, and I uh-huh. I was on Netflix looking, and I I you know what I ended up watching? What? <laughs> DOS Boot. <laughs> <laughs> I never saw that. You never saw Dust Boot? Never saw it. Oh, it was great. I couldn't. I couldn't help but do it. it. It was one of those movies that was just jumping out at me for some reason. And my wife's like, "That you know that movie is like three hours." And I'm like, "Yeah, I, I know. I'm gonna." I got through most of it before I fell asleep. But well, now I'm gonna have to watch it. Yeah, you definitely have to watch. It's all in German, so. I heard a lot about it, but I never saw great it. Movie, but I never uh, actually saw it. Man, it has some scenes in there. You're just like, "Wow, that's awesome." And they're all the little toy boats they had to have been using. When was that made? Seventy something. Was it really seventies? I want to say it was an eighties movie. It may be. It all kind of runs together before night. You hit eight nineteen eighty four, and I don't know anything. Uh, I don't have a like a you know that kind of memory for the, anything before nineteen eighty four. Right. I think that's my cutoff. The only year I reason I remember that is because of Van Halen, but. <laughs> Let's see, 84. I would have been in college in 84. Seriously? Been, yeah. I graduated in 85. You graduated yeah, college in 85? Yeah, because I went to a three-year school. I think I, I mentioned that to you yeah. before. I so I, I started in uh, 82. Graduated high school in 82. Yeah, man. That was fun. Those were fun years. Well, I, I guess now... 
it just kind of evens out when you're older. Yeah. So yeah. it's not like, especially to people younger than you, you know, like my kids. Well, you to think them, that. We're both born in the Stone Age, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, to them it is. But you think like like a, a lot of times when I'm talking to my students and stuff, I one to one, but then they call me sir, and I, that kind of <laughs> kind of bums me out. Yeah, my dad used to love that stuff, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I get that at the grocery store a lot. Yeah, my dad used to my dad used to love those movies too. Uh, he's almost as old as you. <laughs> <laughs> that hurts. Yeah. That cuts deep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know some of the kids that work at the grocery stores mostly because I used to see them when they were at the bus stop here. Mm -hmm. You know, and I get that sir stuff a lot, and I just I'm like, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's that's the way I'm it goes, I guess. All right. So, how you doing on your guy? Uh, I think um, I'm still shaping him up. I mean, what are you almost done with yours? Uh, here's where I'm at. I'm just kind of cleaning things up a little bit, and I'm gonna go and do my line work. All right, let me see. So I'm pretty close. Yeah, you're almost done, man. Yeah, I gotta get some. I gotta get the uh, the, the fire down in there. Oh, that's awesome looking though. Get the the town burning up. Hey, so oh, so we were talking about how uh, about the new movie that's this new Godzilla movie. I saw the trailer. I've only yeah, seen. Yeah, Brian. Cr I want. Say that again. Brian Cranston. Oh yeah. See, okay. Here's my thought on that. I saw Brian Cranston, and you know what? Breaking Bad just ended. You know, for me in my mind. Uh huh. It, it's it's a new thing. So all I can see is Heisenberg versus really? Godzilla. I, I, just the opposite for me. I was seeing, um, I was seeing him as the dad from uh, Malcolm, Malcolm in the Middle. Middle. <laughs> yeah, because he, you know how he does like that sort of whiny kind of thing. Yeah, that, that's that's Malcolm right there. You know. Well, my luckily, I never watched Malcolm in the Middle. I don't. Oh, know why, you got to get you got to get onto Netflix and start watching that. You'll love that one. I've only seen it a couple times. It has that humor that kind of reminds me of uh, that show Scrubs or whatever. Yeah, yeah, and. I just some days I am just not in the mood for that, you know. So I never got into it. Oh, it's so good. You, you Brian got, Cranston is only so, Eisenberg to me. Yeah. Which and I did I watched that, but but it's been a long time since I've seen that. I I think I after I watched the Breaking Bad stuff, I got back into Malcolm because my kids were watching. Oh, it. afterwards. Yeah, the kids were watching Malcolm, and I remember watching Malcolm a lot when when it first came out. But then uh -huh. we got it on Netflix, and the kids got into it. Yeah. Uh, so we were watching a lot of those. So yeah, that's who he is to me. Well, did you ever see that uh, dream sequence they shot with the the lead actor and actors from Malcolm in the Middle, the parents? Yeah. It was Brian Cranston and the and the woman. I don't. I'm not familiar with the show. So I forgot her name. Yeah, but she so plays. Her name is Lois on the show. I don't know what her name is in real life. So he wakes up. And he's like, I had this horrible dream. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. That was so good. I was like, wow, that's that's, that's the, pretty cool to do. Well, do you remember the Bob Newhart when they did that on the yeah. Newhart oh, yeah. show? Yeah. Um, All right, I, bringing up Newhart really does show your age, but I'm, I'm just oh, I used to watch that one all the time. I love that show. I used to watch that on uh, rerun uh, yeah. at night, um, Nickelodeon. So cool. I'm familiar, but. That was another one of those Friday night shows. It was Mary Tyler Moore and then uh, and the Bob Newhart show. See, how have I seen all these Mary Tyler Moore and all these? I I know all these shows. I think I watched all of them. You know. Oh like, well, they they've been in syndication for years. Yeah, so I've seen all of them. It's not like I'm unfamiliar, but. Yeah, but I love the Bob Newhart show, and and I I never realized how ridiculously dated it was until I went watched a few episodes. Play. It's you know, not they one have of the shows that's going to carry over. Your kids are going to go, "Wow, that was really good." But you, the, well, they had um, the, there, there's like that old time show uh, channel. I forget the name of that channel, but um, it's somewhere in the middle of the of the cable channels. Yeah. You can get it. Uh, it's anyways. They show all like the old time shows, and they show that they show that one. They show like Three's Company. They show. <laughs> Wow. Bob Newhart, Mary Tyler Moore, um, Rhoda. Remember Rhoda? <laughs> so, oh yeah. 
So all of those are in there. And um, I was watching the the Newhart show, and I, I it just it's just too much. Like you know, those that they used to wear and stuff, the wide lapels and all that stuff. Oh yeah. I for, had forgotten a lot about how ridiculous fashion was back in those days. His sense um, of humor, I don't know if it if it works anymore the same way. No, because it's too. I think it was a little too. Um, it was a little too soft, you know, for, yeah. for today, you know. Um, and it relied a lot right. on. Um, I think uh, on being patient, you know, and, right? Uh, that that just doesn't exist with that kind of stuff anymore. No. Yeah. But I, I used to love the the guy who played Jerry on that show, and uh, also the neighbor, uh, the guy who was Howard. Uh, I forget his name now, but he was on. Uh, he was also an I Dream a Genie. So. Was he really? Oh uh, yeah. Remember he was the he was the the best friend in that show. Yeah. Oh, I'm trying to picture it now. Oh. He'd always come in and be like, oh, "Hey, Bob," kind of out of breath. And he was the pilot. Remember, he was. <laughs> he was kind of like, "Oh no, he's a navigator. He was a yeah. navigator." And he was always like, <laughs> he always seemed lost, you know. <laughs> Good. All right, so let's see. I got, got the like, ocean in behind him here. Look at you, man! You're killing it. <laughs> What's going on in the background there? Someone invading the house? <laughs> oh, my dog. Anytime. The windows are open because the weather finally decided. Uh, uh, so anything that goes by is fair game. So, yeah, my dog is a uh, is a beagle. And uh, beagles are, uh, like, learned since I we got the dog. They're very vocal. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they have, like, that sort of that bawling bark, like the boom. Kind yeah, of but thing. see, and this is where uh, I went wrong. I blame my neighbor. He's got a beagle, right? Mm -hmm. I was like, I always love the look of beagles. You know, they're they're, they're just yeah. a classic looking kind of dog. You know, right. kid and his beagle, whatever. Snoopy's a beagle. You know, like yeah. So I'm like looking for a dog for my eight year old, who's like begging me for a dog all these years, and then so I'm thinking, oh well, Ruby, this is a dog down the street. She's a wonderful dog. She's quiet. She walks around slow. She doesn't really, you know, she doesn't get too excited about stuff and blah, blah, blah. Come to find out, Ruby is, like, not the typical beagle. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, my I grandfather got, had one. I got robbed, man. <laughs> I was dog in the you got hoodwinked. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, uh, I don't know, man. She would be great if I had a yard and a, Big field. And she could go run and. Oh yeah, yeah. She would chase everything around and. Yeah, she would. She may never even come back, but. You know, so be it. Whatever. Ooh, this head is gigantor. Shrink that down. I'm really having problems with this one today. My grandfather had a beagle. Yeah. When we were kids, I remember. Yeah. Her name was Bunny. That beagle. Was the probably the oldest dog I've ever seen in my life. Really? Thing, it lived to be, oh my God, it lived to be like 100. And I just yeah, remember, when we were, yeah, when we were little kids, that dog was old, you know? Right. <laughs> and that dog just, I remember, that dog just seemed to live forever. Maybe maybe it's that. My, my uh, grandfather's poodle was like that. Yeah, he loved that dog. He just loved that dog. Take that thing everywhere. Yeah, I, I like dogs, but I like dogs that are useful. Uh -huh. <laughs> that makes any sense. Uh -huh. And I like dogs that have a purpose. My dog doesn't have a purpose after my kid decided he doesn't like walking the dog anymore. We yeah. saw, yeah, well, that gets, yeah, that gets old fast, doesn't it? So when we don't have a yard, I can just let him let the dog go. And, yeah, that's hard. So, so you gotta, and you gotta follow your dog around with the little plastic bag, probably too, right? Because you're in the neighborhood. More. Uh, dehumanizing than cleaning up after a dog. Oh, I know. I know. And, well, at least I do it, though, or I have the boys. Yeah, you have to, yeah. But the uh, some of my neighbors don't uh, think that that's necessary for some reason. Well, just let it fly, huh? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. That's always pleasant. Oh, uh, no. I get pretty upset about it, but... Uh, yeah, because I'm always the guy who ends up stepping in it. Well, my neighbor, he, the same guy that has the really nice beagle... He got so sick of it, he went and got these um, dog baggy poop station things where you can, like, throw the poop away in the bags. Oh, wow. So he put them, his own money, 
he emailed the uh, homeowners association. Was like, I'm putting these doggy bins up so people can throw away the feces from their dogs. Yeah. I'm going to mount it on the sign, the no parking signs that you guys put up. And if you don't like it, you can take them down. <laughs> so did they give them a hard they time about it, or were they okay with it? They didn't. They didn't even respond to his email. They've left them up. Yeah. They've been there for months. Yeah. That's and good. And you know what, though? Are he they out the trash bags every week or every other day, huh. on his own. Wow. He's like he's like the best neighbor I've ever had. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So he he puts the thing up. He empties the trash bin every time he walks the dog when it's full, and uh, he takes care of the whole thing. We went um, to Harris Teeter yesterday, and they had. Um, it was the dog visit visiting day, like they do like adoption day at the yeah, oh yeah, pet store out there. They had the coolest dog out there. Uh-oh. He was this little um, he was like a mix between an English bulldog and a corgi. <laughs> what? <laughs> he was so ridiculous. He had like the big head, you know, like the English uh, oh, yeah. bulldogs do, but like the little body, like the corgi. It was hilarious. His name was Morty. He was great. <laughs> Morty. Morty. Yeah. Oh. Good name. It was really good. It was fun. And you didn't take him home? Uh, you know, I was thinking about it, but then I was like, well, I got a dog. Do I really need another one? Nope. Oh, man. These eyes are all I'll wrong. tell you right now, nope. I don't know. We'll see. I don't know. The, the dog that we have is enough. That's One is enough. Well, and what's your dog now? Uh, three, I think, now. Three. Yeah, she's still young. It's a pretty calm dog. Yeah, she's pretty sweet, too. We've never had one like that before. All the other dogs we have have always been kind of kind oh, of wild. Crazy. Well, I've always had male dogs, too. You know, I've never had a female mm-hmm. dog before. So. All right, I finally got past the head on this mecha guts. All right, nice. Oh, you got him shooting stuff out of his eyes, too. Cool. Yeah, well, he had this rainbow, like, laser ray that would come out. It looked really yeah. cool back in the old hi-fi color, you know type of movie days. Yeah. But I guess the story is this alien... Hold on one sec. These alien people... So the... I'm sorry. No, they, well, he was designed to fight, you know, and pretend to be Godzilla, so he, when they first showed up, I guess, he uh, he looked like Godzilla. Uh-huh. And he had the skin over him or something, but then, then Godzilla, like, shoots him with his atomic breath... Ray or something. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. All the flesh like burns off of them. And underneath there's Mecha Godzilla and it's this giant robot. Now I like giant robots, man. I was a big fan of the yeah, giant yeah. robot cartoons when I was a kid. Right. Um we had Voltron and Oh yeah, yeah, I remember all that. Transformers stuff. and all that stuff. Don't tell me you worked on Voltron too. No, I didn't. I worked on uh Power Rangers though. Power Rangers. See, they were the big robot kind of show too. Yeah, that I remember when they first really came out. Power Rangers. Power Rangers stuff for uh, or no for um, Parker Brothers when they first came out. Yeah, that was a uh, that was a big deal. It's pop it was really popular back then. It still kind of is. There's a new surge of it going on, but it's like from the original Japanese um, stuff. Well, the I remember parents always not really loving that stuff too much, because you know the kids would always be like karate chopping each other and stuff, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, my kids seem to like the Power Rangers. Your kids did. Yeah, and they liked um, liked uh, Pokemon too. Yeah, my teenagers still like Pokemon. Uh huh. Well, that's they my like my Rangers, oldest. But... My oldest loved it. He learned how to read uh, plan. The DS. Yeah. Because he oh, wanted playing that, that RPG games. game. Yeah, I loved it. Loved for years, that. I've been buying the game for my Game Boy system, um, just to have something to talk about with the kids, you know. And the, mm-hmm. it's worked pretty well, even up into high school, because I can always say, "Hey, I, I can't beat this guy. What am I supposed to do?" <laughs> my son is like the Pokemon encyclopedia, and he's like 14, and he's like. Oh, you got to get, you know, this grass type of Pokemon. and, then, and <laughs> Yeah, Charizard, I call you. <laughs> yeah, and then do all this stuff, and I'm like, wow, okay. You should be studying in school or something, because you can remember all that stuff, but you ask him a math problem, you know, it's like, ah. Yeah. 
Well, that's okay because he's probably going to be a gamer. He's going to he's going to work in the game industry, right? Uh, I keep talking to him about engineering, uh-huh. but you know, software engineering, you know, mathematical engineering. But both of them are kind of really big game. Uh, well, it could, couldn't be in a better area for that. Well, that's what I'm thinking. But does he have the art gene in him? No, n- neither of them. Well. They they certainly don't enjoy um, practicing the mm-hmm. art. Yeah. But I think they've got you know the skill set to do it mm-hmm. or the the knack for doing it. But yeah. they just don't do it. And uh, my daughters do, but um, but it manifests itself with a lot of um, cutesy cartoon drawing and and uh, my da- one of my daughters loves doing crafts of anything. So. Oh yeah, yeah. If it's building something or creating something or everything from braiding hair to uh, making bracelets or whatever, she's all about it. I mean, right. She could do that all day. Yeah, for sure. Well, my daughter's the same way. She loves that kind of stuff. Yeah. I was always... I don't think I really got into doing art. I think until I was probably... I think the first time I remember doing, you know, a decent art project was great. I liked it before then, but I, I didn't really feel like I had an aptitude till uh, till I was about fifth or sixth grade, maybe, you know. That's pretty early. <laughs> it started to, yeah, it started to come out about then, you know. Yeah, um, I I was always the drawing kid. Um, yeah. Uh-huh. We moved a lot, so that was like that was my my thing, you know. Right. Uh, but. Yeah, I would say early elementary school. I remember winning like a blue ribbon at this county fair or something once, you know, uh-huh. um, where we lived. And I thought that was pretty cool for a drawing of a house I did. I still remember that house. You know, it's like weird what you remember. Yeah, but sure. It was green. I don't know why. but. So were your parents behind it? Did they back you up on it? Uh, uh, they. I think my artistic talent sort of developed out of, because my mom was kind of an artist, uh-huh. and uh, I, I don't even say kind of an artist, she's like a really good artist, actually, but sure, yeah. I liked it when she would draw stuff, like my dad would draw stuff for me, or my mom would draw stuff for me, and they would just say, well, why don't you draw it? And after a while, they got sick of drawing stuff for me, and they were like, why don't you just draw it yourself? Yeah. So I did, and I used to like... Um, Saturday morning, or not Saturday morning, but like the comic strips in the newspaper. Oh, right, the funnies, yeah. So I was all about those, and I would trace them, and I would redraw them. I, I, for some reason, in elementary school, I got into Heathcliff. Oh, right, yeah, I remember that. I thought it was drawn so well, and I really got into you know, that, and I tried to copy it and do all kinds of cool stuff with that. But. Yeah, I did the same thing with Peanuts. I, I loved Peanuts. Um, I loved the Peanuts ca- cartoons, and I remember... Um, that's really, I think, how I learned how to do um, cartooning was by tracing that stuff. You know, I used to trace the um, all the drawings of Snoopy and Charlie Brown, and I loved that stuff. And I learned to draw it pretty well, and I got to to a point where I didn't have to trace it anymore. I could just draw it, you know? Right. Um, and then after that, then I started getting into trying to do more realistic stuff. I like the Yeah, I think most teenagers do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My downfall was Marvel Comics. Once I saw Marvel Comics, I was like, "Wow, that's awesome!" You know? Yeah, I, I wanted to be able to draw that stuff, but everything I drew always came out looking like a cartoon, you know? Not, oh, not really, that, not that kind of cartoon, but like a like a kind of. A, and and I went through a phase in college where I again I was trying to to get the realism, but I just it never really came for me. It always kind of it came out looking like a cartoon. So eventually, I just said, "Oh, I'll just draw a cartoon." I had a transition where I, I, I switched over real fast. I, mm-hmm. I had appendicitis in seventh grade and I was laid up in the hospital for like a long time because I, bet. Yeah. I had a ruptured uh, appendix and uh-huh. a terrible infection and all that kind of stuff happened. So you got to so, find something to do with yourself. Well, yeah, and then since I was in there for so long, I ended up with my own room in an army hospital and they didn't have anything. So I ended up with this little black and white TV, but I didn't like watching the TV as much. So my dad would bring comic books from the the PX downstairs. Oh, that's cool. 
And I can remember the first comic book I had. I must have read that comic book like five billion times. It was just like this uh, John Byrne drawn uh, Incredible Hulk. Oh, wow. And that guy's artwork, man, I was like, this is what... So I would just draw, and I would sit there and read comics, and, and I would just get all these different comics because the PX had no sense of comic book order. But that's how I got into the, the artwork thing and thought, that's what I want to do. That's all I said I was going to do. Yeah. And from then on, uh, that's all I pretty much did. <laughs> wow. I think... Um, I don't think I really understood that this was going to be what I was going to do uh, until I was out of college and I was in my... Was you waited my, that long to figure it out? Well, yeah, because I, I wanted to... When I went to school, I, t I talked to um, one of my teachers and I said, you know, I, I really... I'm thinking about going into illustration. And he was like, you're crazy, kid. You're never yeah, going to... Yeah, and he guffawed loudly and was yeah. like... <laughs> He's like, you know what? There's like two or three illustrators out there making money, you know? And you, he said, go into advertising. That's where the money is. So I did. I went into advertising, and I was there for a couple of years. And it was okay, but I didn't really love it. And the job that I had as an art director, I, I was allowed to um, you know, sort of create these ads. And, and a lot of them that I, that I started to work on, I started to throw little cartoons in here and there, you know. Um, and they, they started to get popular. So... Um, we ended up selling a, a bunch of them to different clients, and, and it kind of started to take off a little bit. And I realized, like, you know, there is a way to make a living at this stuff. Um, so I started to to look around at different places that were yeah. you know, that were more like that, and it turns out that um, there was one that was not too far from where I was living, and they were looking for somebody to to uh, to join the their art crew. Um, and what they did was. Um, so it's like a like a meetup kind of thing, or what? No, this was a an actual company. This company, okay. um, they they would make those toys like the kind of stuff that you get in uh, cereal boxes, and you know, with your Happy Meal and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, so they, these were the guys who used to do that stuff. I thought, wow, that would be cool. Imagine if like, and I because I used to just draw those for fun, you know, just for. Sure. For laughs when I was at school, I would draw. You know, like when when I was in college, I used to draw them and just kind of goofing around with my friends. You know, I would draw like Ronald McDonald or, or uh, oh, I don't know, uh, Captain Crunch or that kind of stuff. Well, th then this company was going to actually pay me to draw them for real. You know, so I was like, wow, that that doesn't get any cooler than that. So I went yeah. and I started working with them for you know for a little bit, um, and that was a really fun job. I really love that job. Because we were always drawing all those little things, and we we're sort of on top of you know whatever was was fresh or new in the cartoon world, you know. So I remember right. working on all those things. Um, so you you got a chance to draw just about everything that came down the pipe, pretty much. Yeah, anything that was popular. We did a lot of Disney stuff, and we did a lot of um, you know uh, Cartoon Network and those kind of things, you know. Um, right. Warner Brothers was big in those days. They had um, what were those crazy little things? Animaniacs. I did a lot of stuff. Animaniacs. You drew Animaniacs. Oh yeah, yeah, all that stuff. And so um, that that job uh, was just it was really fun, but it didn't last long. Um, I probably it, told this story. Well, about, don't ever last long enough. Yeah, but. yeah. I, pr I probably told you this story about fifteen times, but um, that job is what kind of got me into doing the freelance stuff. The, yeah. When the job ended. Um, I had to go out and start looking for work, and so there was a lot of opportunity in my area to do that kind of stuff, you know, with all those toy companies that, that were around me. Right. So they're still up there. Just kind of falling there. Yeah, there. Yeah, Hasbro's still there. And I don't know, Parker Brothers, I think, is... I don't even know if that's still around or what they did. I think they merged with um, with Milton Bradley, but they were up there, too. One so, of my relatives works for one of them companies, a toy yeah. company up there in New England. Yeah. yeah. The, and they were fun. They would, you know, they would. we would do all these games and stuff during the year... And then uh, we get to go see them down at Toy Fair. And that was always kind of cool. Oh yeah. And uh, boy, they, those yeah, guys. It's cool to get a job toy. working at a toy company, man. It, yeah, the, I mean, it, it it was fun. It was good. You know, it was good to be where I was. I, I imagine like a lot of the designers worked pretty hard, you know. Um, but but my job was always fun doing that stuff, like you know, doing those illustrations and all that kind of stuff. Boy, that was that was cool. Um. All right, let's see. I gotta do here. 
I think we'll give him. Should I have him breathing that fire thing that he, or that sort of weird ray that used to come out of his mouth? Oh, right? Okay, so you'll win this this whole show if you can do the scream that Godzilla did. But. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. <laughs> no, dang it. That was the oh, most man. iconic noise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or sound. Yeah, because and it's one of those. It's almost like the Tarzan yell, you know. You, you just, exactly. Yeah. It's like the the Wilhelm scream of giant monsters, you know. It, I gotta tell you, this is the one function that I love about having uh, the Cintiq here with with Photoshop. Oh, the uh, rotation. Yeah, the rotation, man. How much? How great is that? You know what, though, I have actually heard critique on. There's a new Cintiq tablet out, right? Uh huh. Hardware, because I'm I'm like obsessed with Wacom's hardware for some reason. Right. But um, that critiques on their hardware. That okay, so the the Cintiq that you've got, and I think the same one I have. It has a cradle on it, right, where the Cintiq just kind of rests in there. Yes. Yeah. And you can actually rotate the screen physically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, ever since Adobe put in, and a lot of these other art programs that I've had a chance to play with, um, they put in a digital rotate for the canvas. Yeah. You don't need it anymore. So Wacom took it out for their 24 HD model. Uh-huh. yeah. So you can't rotate it, right? It sits on this really heavy base that sits on top of the tabletop. Uh-huh. And then you can unhook it, basically, from its base, and it drops down into your lap while holding onto the desk. Huh. So it's this, it's a beautiful piece of engineering as far as drawing goes, For if you if you ask me. Uh, yeah. That's my opinion. I should sell these things because I, I like them. But um, I don't know. What's going on with this one? What's that? The I like the the being able to rotate the thing right on the desktop. That's kind of nice, you know. Well, I think they still have that feature on one of their models. But if you go to like the higher end version of it, right? They they took it out, so you can't rotate the screen. But it's a huge screen, so it's almost yeah. like yeah, uh, it's unnecessary. And I think Wacom took a chance on some of the design things because they they're always trying to solve some problem here or there. And I think they're much more. Um, focused on artists uh, than the community actually gives them credit for. They get a lot of flack because they're kind of a monopoly on the technology they've developed. And they have a patent and they don't share it without, you know, some exorbitant cost associated right. with it. Right. So you can't. It's hard to find a competitor to Wacom's hardware, and you know I think this uh, for several reasons. One, they just make pretty solid. Devices that last for years, and you're going to be hard pressed to find a device that does this uh, as well. Now there's right. some new ones that are coming out and all that kind of stuff, but man, they cannot make a right move to save their life, uh, as far as artists are concerned. If if you look online, I mean, people are just foaming at the mouth waiting for <laughs> Wacom to like go bang. Yeah, because they just want everything. They want everything free. Yeah. Yeah. But. There's some new ones that are coming out of China that are pretty promising. I've seen some guys review them online, and they, they say that the, they're they're really functional. They they do a really good job, you know. Yeah, they're cheap too. Geez, I yeah, saw one for like three hundred bucks or something like that. Yeah. Didn't I? Oh my gosh. I, I mean, three hundred bucks versus you know two thousand bucks. Who's gonna win that? Right. Well, that's the thing. Uh, I, I think it's gonna get more competitive. I'm glad to see it, but. Um, I'll tell you this much. I I, I got the companion because I'm I'm still, yeah yeah. I was just looking at that this morning. I'm still waiting for the perfect mobile situation. So we got the mobile hardware down pretty good. I think it's pretty close. Uh, it's certainly passable, but you have to run Windows. Yeah, what's it's up with that? I hate that. Yeah. And, I, you know, your opinion on Windows is, uh, you know, your opinion on Windows. If you use it, that's what you use, and that's what you're used to, and you'd be fine with it. Uh, though I think the latest version of the operating system is is uh, sort of split between two worlds, and I think it's hurting them. Yeah, I use the Windows when I teach, but um, I definitely prefer Mac. And that's just because that's what I learned on, you know, but yeah. I find it to be a little... I don't know, just a little easier to use for me, because it, it's it's the way it's my thought pattern when I go in is more Mac oriented because I've been using it for so long. 
Yeah. And I, you know, if if I had time or the inclination, I could explain why I, I like OS 10 better. I think I I've, I've quantified it pretty well. Um, for like real kind of interface reasons, but you know, honestly, once you get inside the Adobe environment or whatever software environment you're used to, um, it's pretty much that that environment across the board. So you could like when you teach Adobe stuff, you teach um, you teach Windows just as easy as you do you use um, OS 10 at home. So pretty much, and I have students that come from both ends. You know, some some are Windows and some are Mac users, and and the ones who are Mac users always have a tough time getting into the Windows machines. Oh, really? Yeah, because it's it's very. Uh, counterintuitive compared to the Mac, you know. Mac is all drag and drop and all that kind of stuff. So they always, they get those guys get frustrated a lot uh, when they come in. Well, I you know I've noticed the biggest thing I've had a problem is is just simply doing things like saving a file or opening a file, locating it inside mm -hmm. the yeah Explorer or Windows Explorer or whatever they call it, and and I just can't find what I'm looking for. You have to go through so many different ways, and I don't know why that is. Yeah, the the organization um, that they have is 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 very different from Mac, and and I love the way that Mac has like those folders set up and stuff. So it's easier for me to find stuff when I'm on my Mac. Yeah. Um, and then the search seems to be a, seems to be a lot more intuitive as well. You know, like if you need to find something, and I like what Mac did uh, recently with the, being able to attach you know those uh, metadata tags to things. You know. Oh yeah. That's really nice. So, I'm so aside that. from a couple of you know. Issues. I haven't had two, you know, some minor issues like in the Explorer, Windows Explorer, or whatever the the file system that they use. Uh, haven't had too many problems, but I wouldn't say that the companion tablet is a great functional computer, uh -huh. like for using it, you know, emailing and web browsing and all that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, but drawing on it, man, holy smokes, I love it. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to, and I'm, I know that those things will just continue to get better and better. And I've noticed that um, the the memory capacity is starting to increase too, which is great. Yeah. So I, I got one. I think it's uh, 256 gigabytes of storage on it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty darn good. Um, I, I don't think I've had a laptop or a mobile computer that's had anything higher than that. Uh, my MacBook Pros in past years have been about that hard drive space wise, anyway. Yeah, yeah. But what did you just? I was talking like to a guy on Twitter. Um, he does uh, web comics for his living, uh -huh. and um, he was using the Surface Pro, which is another Windows 8 tablet that Microsoft built. It's pretty good. Uh -huh. And. Uh, he said it just was too small, so he ended up getting the other companion tablet, which kind of plugs into your computer when right. you use it at a desk. And then um, he got uh, he got that, and then he's using it with his MacBook Pro laptop. So he can use the the companion tablet size screen and everything, draw on it, get all the benefits of that while he's sitting at a desk. But the only problem is. When he unplugs it, it becomes an Android tablet. Oh, I see. Which I don't have any experience with the Android platform. Right. And from what I've seen on the phones, uh, and you know the different splintered uh, versions of Android, and you know every mobile company's got their version of it, and you know that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, one of my friends is a tech support guy, and he says it's just. You'd be surprised how many phones are still using Android operating system from years ago, huh. and uh, it's you know complicated for them to maintain and stuff. But that's probably not something I have to worry about. But yeah, my son uses that on his phone. He's got the Android phone. He loves it, but but the other one is uh, on on the Mac, you know, so or on yeah. the uh, the iOS. So I don't know, man. I I, yeah, I don't know enough about that stuff to really to really have much of an opinion on it. Well, the only thing that I was like uh, was pointing out is like if he has to go anywhere and wants to take his full setup with Adobe and everything else, he's got to um, take a laptop and the tablet with him. Oh, the, yeah. What's the point so, of that? Yeah, it kind of ruins the whole mobility of it. 
But I don't know, man. I, I think we're the day is coming. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's almost there. We're there. We're we're very very close to what we were thinking about. You know, like when I first I remember when the um, the iPad first came out, that was my vision of it. I was like, oh man, I'm gonna be able to draw on the iPad. And then I realized like. Yeah, you can kind of draw on it, but it's not really the strongest thing to, to use for art, you know. It's just not quite there yet. Well, so. they, they keep trying, and I think the the nature of the type of screen that it has built in right now right. is making that uh, is the biggest limiting factor. Yeah, because you got to use the big fat finger or else the big fat, yeah. you know, uh, pencil or pen or whatever you're going to use. They're all giant and fat and ridiculous. So I'm, I'm still waiting. I'm, I'm holding out hope that this is going to happen sometime. Uh, we've got to see it very soon at this point, you know, with that, with, with yeah. what's happening out there. So, all right, let's see. Let's get some, get some blue teeth here. Actually, I think you should have yellow teeth. I think that's a given. Yeah, yellow. We're going to go with yellow instead of blue. Pop that up to that layer there. So one of these days we're gonna have to do this stuff in Illustrator, right? Oh, you just draw something in Illustrator by yeah. itself. Well, I don't know. We do a lot of stuff in Photoshop. I think just because it's quicker, right? Oh, uh, that's why I'm using it. And then, um, oh yeah, I uh, I have to think about it. I think we could do it in Illustrator just as easy. Although mostly when I use Illustrator, I draw in something else and then import it. Yeah, same here. And so I don't know. I just chose Photoshop since we're just sketching basically and just yeah. drawing for fun. Yeah, um, yeah. But it goes much faster when you're working with Photoshop, I think, than Illustrator. Yeah. Um, if you're just if you're just doing the, the sketch drawing like we're doing here, um, I use it a lot, but um, it seems to be a little bit more precise and requires a little more precision, I think, and a little more forethought when you're drawing. You know. Yeah. So you have to, to or, or a little more planning, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Well, you're definitely committing to things in Illustrator differently because the line work, you're not going to have to go back and erase anything. It, it is what it is when you put it down, you know. And then, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. And it's, it's also, um, as you're, when you're drawing in it, it's, it's a little bit more, well, you can always, you can, I mean, you can always edit stuff, but it's a little more final, I think, in, in Illustrator. Than it certainly it. feels that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the capacity to edit is one of the things I love about that program. Yeah, but um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, don't get me wrong. Illustrator has been my bread and butter for the last what ten years at least. Oh sure, yeah. Um, once I got capable enough in vector artwork, it just made more sense to to do stuff in Illustrator. Uh, and I was frustrated for a long time, yeah, up until I even first met you, was doing the kind of artwork I was doing for comic book illustration. Uh -huh. Uh, doing it in Photoshop just wasn't working at the time because I didn't yeah, have the Cintiq back then. Right. And I was always irritated by how heavy duty the Photoshop files had to be. Yeah. To get an effective resolution. And um, I just couldn't do it that well in Photoshop. I just didn't. So I would ink everything on paper. Right. Yeah, I remember those in. days. Ooh. I spent so much time fixing files once I got them in the computer that it just it was taking the fun out of it. Yeah. I, you know, yeah, it becomes drudgery after a while. Yeah. So um, then, once I talked to you about digital inking, I had seen yeah. some people doing that, and I heard about people doing that, but I never really had a tangible like like example of it. And then I saw your work, and you were saying it was all done on on tablets and Illustrator, and I was like, "That's that's the way to go, man. That's the." <laughs> yeah, that's I was surprised that you weren't doing that. It seemed like it's such a natural thing, you know. Uh, you know, because of the kind of community, I think I was drawing a lot of uh, stuff from uh -huh. the comic book community. Uh, drawing stuff on paper and then bringing it to the computer was just the way it is, and it still is for a lot of guys. That's old school, though, right? Yeah, that's the old school way to do it. Yeah, it's a little old school. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, they have some issues in comic book, uh, the comic book world that they're dealing with where uh, artists make a lot of money by selling the original pages. That's right. 
So if you draw for like Marvel Comics or DC Comics, they own the rights to the reproduction for the artwork, but you own the boards. Right, and nobody wants to buy a print. They want to buy the original piece. Exactly. Yeah. So there's some guys making some creative uh, uh, things where they'll, they'll pencil digitally and then print it out and right. then ink it on paper. Yeah. Which, you know, what's the difference in a print, really? You know what I mean? It's... I have a friend who um, who works um, as a syndicated cartoonist, and and he does all his stuff by hand. For that very reason, he wants to have the originals, um, and all the boards he does are done by hand. Um, and then he'll and he does them with with a pen, you know, like a series of pens. Yeah. I think he uses like those microns or whatever. Right. Um, and then he takes those, scans them in, and colors them digitally. So uh, the original. Uh, black and white is done on the board. Then he scans those and 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 colors them. I think in Photoshop. But I always found like you know, th why? I understand the the reason they do it, but I, for me, it doesn't make sense to to have to draw things over and over again. Right. Just get it done. You know, get it done as quickly as possible. That's always been my motive because time is money. You know. Right. Oh yeah. I, I, you know, I don't have a good argument either way on that. Um, yeah, I, I miss, um, you know, like back in the old days, everything I created was created by hand with a brush. Yeah. And so I have a lot of those pieces hanging up, and I miss, you know, the the, the fine art that kind of went into doing all that stuff that way. Right. Because well, we used to. Well, how much has really changed? I have some friends now that are artists, and the new way of doing it for the comic book scene is to buy a photo printer. Mm-hmm. And they'll go to conventions and they'll sell prints of their work. And I don't know if they print it right there at the table or they take orders for the day. Uh -huh. Or they print some out before they go. They try and sell those. And then during the day, if they run out, they take an order. The next day they show up with all these prints they print from their hotel room. Right. And the printers are pretty good. You know, they're photo printers of... And they there's a sort of a hive mind uh, opinion on some of those printers that yeah these are good ones and these are not right, good ones right, right. and they sell prints for you know 20 bucks you know oh, and yeah I was selling original sketches back in the 90s for 20 bucks you know we really yeah nowadays they're still selling them for 20 bucks <laughs> well a lot of the the art that I used to do um, was kept by the agencies Oh yeah, uh, the sure. art directors used to they used to go and they'd grab them and then they would frame them and have them hanging up in their offices, you know. Right. Um, and they'd pay a little extra to do a buyout, but uh, I wish I would have been able to keep some of those, particularly the um, the one I did for Little Mermaid. Oh yeah, that would have been nice to have. But the uh, there was guys, the art director and the creative director were fighting over that one when I brought it in. Oh man, I can't wait to put this. Hey, no, I was the one who did the project, you know. Right, right. <laughs> oh yeah, well I'm keeping it, you know. So, oh well. Easy come, oh, easy go, I suppose, right? Well, see, that's the thing. I, you know, the nature of uh, just having another commodity to sell, um, it's getting weirder and weirder. I just see so many artists working for so little money than what oh, they used. It's heartbreaking, yeah. And it w started happening when I was in the 90s trying to do the comic book thing. Yeah. And, you know, I made a, I made a first big break and was doing inking pages for this guy, DC, and all stuff. So my page rate went up. All of a sudden, my page rate went up, and then all the work dried up. Yeah. No one wanted to pay a guy, you know, hundred bucks a page to ink a book, even if uh, he was good. So. It just yeah, wasn't. those those days are, are are over pretty much. You know, the the there was a heyday, I think, back at you know for particularly for uh, children's books too, back in the in the eighties and the nineties. Uh, that just never kind of really came back. So what I want to figure out, and maybe we can, I know I know you do this with your other podcasts and stuff, mm -hmm. we can talk to artists and see how they're making money now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know... Um, well, we should have some other artists come on. We could talk to them while we're doing this thing. That would be great. Yeah, it'd be fun. And then people wouldn't have to see me butchering back at Godzilla today. <laughs> well, I mean... You know, we'll just have them come on and draw what we're drawing, and we'll just talk while we're while we're drawing. I think that'd be fun. 
Okay, so I did I did pretty good so far, man. I think I'm getting close to where okay. I want to stop. Okay. Um, I got a pretty good draw. I finally fixed the head on this guy. Although, I don't know. Uh, you're not loving it? Yeah, I think if I look at it tomorrow, I, I'll like it a lot better. Okay. I'm liking what you're doing, though. Oh, thanks. Yeah, this is just we're. I'm just kind of goofing around with this guy here, but if I was, if I had a little bit more time, I'd do some really dramatic shading with him. Uh, make it like a nighttime scene, but do me a favor and zoom in, though. How's that? Yeah. See that better? Is that oh, better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sometimes I keep it far away so I can see the whole thing a little easier because my hand blocks it. When yeah, I'm oh yeah. Shading, so I need to see what's going on. So I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit and then uh, kind of come in again later on, kind of tighten things up. But I don't know. I always have fun just sometimes just sitting down and drawing. Last night I was working on something and I wasn't really planning on doing much with it, but um, the thing that I love about you know, the way uh, that we do these things is you start to learn some of those tools that you don't use all that often, and right. so then you can plug them into projects later on, you know? So... Um, well, it's always good to draw, no matter what. Yeah. It doesn't... yeah, it's always a learning process. Well, last summer I went to a painting seminar with my mother, and I haven't oil painted since... Oh, college. I remember you were talking about that, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, man, you want to talk about a learning experience. Oh boy, that yeah, that's. Mm. I was I was probably I was in the class, and you know a lot of these classes are filled by uh, wealthy older people. Sure. And they want to pay artists to show them what they do, and they want to paint. They some of them were professional artists, and some of them weren't. Uh -huh. um, some of them were just you know big fans of the art form and just enjoyed it, but. Man, I was it. I did really well the first day or two when it was all just you know laying out paintings and right doing the drawing and. But man, there was a there's a hump there where you transition <laughs> from uh, the paint sketches and the studies into sort of finalizing what you're doing. Uh huh. And that was that was brutal. I was like, oh my gosh, I just have not done this. But I mean, it's still fun. I had a great time just. Doing something I hadn't done in a long time artistically, and yeah, that was. I I was never really that great with the oils, and I always struggled with those uh, acrylics. I was better at because they made sense to me, but I could never figure out like, you know, thick and thin paint and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I never got into it deeply enough to to start to understand that stuff. So it was always just, you know, me trying to teach myself, and then it being an exercise in frustration. So yeah, that's what I'm going to do when I get older. Is do a little oil painting. Yeah, because I, I, I think, think I, I would go with watercolor. Water. Yeah, I I think I could do it longer. I think I could do it like old the old like I can do it into my nineties. You, you probably could. I think I think um, watercolor would be my thing. Uh, yeah, I, I, was, yeah. I got along a little bit better with that, and I and I like the looseness of it. You know the. Oh yeah. Well, you really, that that takes a, a, a Zen approach for sure, man. If you watercolor, <laughs> oh yeah, if you go into watercolor and, and you're and you're not feeling relaxed, man, forget it. Just go home. Yeah, I I know a guy in, in uh, he lives in some beach town uh -huh. down in South Carolina, like Hilton Head Island. Okay. This guy who moved there, and he teaches people how to paint. He he was like an artist in residence at a hotel. Nice. And he would sell his paintings and prints and stuff in the lobby. Uh -huh. And then people would go to Hilton Head, and he said he would make so much money because people would need something to do with their kids and their wives right. after a few days of being there. And he would take them out to the beach and paint. Nice. That sounds like a fun day. Yeah. That's rough, huh? Yeah, why not? You know, why not? If you got that kind of aptitude, go with it. Yeah, he was pretty good too, man. I met him at a Boy Scout summer camp. He was taking his son to summer camp. Uh -huh. He was a scout leader or whatever. And he would sit in the woods all day painting while his son was off doing merit badge classes. Wow, that that there's nothing wrong with that. I'd Dude, love to do that. This guy had it all figured out, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got to get that that traveling easel with you, right? Exactly.
usually <laughs> you gotta you gotta park yourself near a water source, you know, like <laughs> so oh, it was great. Get man. that clean clean water onto the onto those brushes. Oh, yeah. So he would just paint, dude. It was it was awesome. Yeah, that's cool. And then some days he wouldn't paint, he would just sit around drinking tea all day. <laughs> Yeah, nice, nice. I'll get a little dark here, I think. I'm going to lighten up on this a little bit. Just lighten up the eyes a little bit. I think yeah, yeah, good. it's getting a little dark. The darkness is good, though, on the skin, though. It, uh, yeah, the, um, this tablet uh, tends to um, to look a little lighter when I'm drawing it and then appear a little darker on in the um, the screen here. i got to adjust my colors a little bit or, or adjust my settings on this thing. Because when I look at... Uh, this the the thing that you're looking at um, yeah. over on the other monitor. It's uh, it's a little bit the colors are a little bit deeper uh, than they are than they appear to me when I'm working on this tablet. So I got to fix that. Otherwise, that's gonna that's gonna make a mess of my stuff. Ah, it looks good. Well, you don't want you don't want any surprises, you know, when you're when you're putting stuff out uh, to, that's gonna get printed. You know, that's the last thing you want is a surprise comes back and you're like, whoa, did I, is that, is that my art? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want that. Uh, you should try uh, uh, doing artwork for that's going to be etched into a wrestling belt, let me tell you. Oh, I believe it, yeah. I believe I've it. gotten some stuff back, man. And I had Shocking. no idea that that was going to happen. Yeah. And you can't go back and fix it. Like, No, it's a, it's a little different when you're doing that kind of stuff. Oh, God. So I don't even I don't even think about color correction anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I try not to get too hung up on it, but you, again, like you don't want to you don't want to be surprised when that stuff comes rolling yeah, off the press. Definitely. And you don't want your client being surprised either. Although they'll be less surprised because they're not seeing what you're seeing. Yeah, what do, what do they expect? You know. Well, they expect what they get, and if your calibration's different than theirs. Then they they never saw the original, so they they don't have the same expectations that you're gonna have. They're just gonna say, "Oh, that looks just like what you gave me." And, and then you look at it, you're like, well, "What did I give you?" Oh my God, that's what I gave you? Yeah. Yeah, that you don't want that. Maybe I will shave this one. I don't know. Let's see. So I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap up fairly soon. Whenever you're ready, you just let me know because I'm just kind of I'm just kind of milking it. it now a little bit. I just colored the eyes in. That's all I just did. Uh, oh, nice! I love that. So it didn't come out too bad. Yeah, I was struggling at first, man. They they had some design sensibility back then that just was, was totally different than it is now. Well, they had different limitations um, on That's what right. they could actually build, you know. So yeah, I think I'm gonna call it, man. This is Mecha Godzilla. All right. Well, that sounds cool. I think we'll. Uh... I'll wrap up here. I, I could milk this thing out for another hour if we, if you wanted to, but I think we're good. I think we're good. We'll just, I'll leave it here, and we, I'm, I'm not going to do the, the big background like I usually do. I'll just leave it with just like this. I think that's of. good right there, man. Yeah. He's got the atomic heat blast. <laughs> yeah. Stomping on some. Is that an elementary school, Bob? Jeez, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a <laughs> there you go, kids. Yeah. <laughs> So no school tomorrow. You might as well live in Apex. Rah! <laughs> There's never school in Apex. I'll, even I just have to think about snow. Well, He's, I will say this, and you could probably talk about it better than I could, but I like how organic and analog your artwork looks, even though it's 100% digital. I mean, look at that. Oh well, that's the. I mean, that's the fun of of working with the big tablet, as you can start to get some, um, you know, some some brushes and things that you can develop as you're going. Like when I was working with the um, with the uh, Intuos, it was you I had a hard time actually drawing um, spontaneously. But with this, you can just draw right on top of it. So it's almost like drawing on paper. There, I had to plan everything out. So all my drawing was going on on my sketches as opposed to my finished art. Here, yeah, it looks like you're here you do little sketches. You do the color kind of like a watercolor or a marker wash kind of thing. You got the highlights with like a we used to use a white color pencil. Yeah, that yeah, how I used to do it back in the day when we used to do the marker comps. That's I'm using yeah. the same technique only doing it digitally. Zoom in to where you're working so you, people can see. All right, so if I was going to go in here, um, this you can see this brush right here. It's kind of like a pencil brush. 
So yeah. I like I like using like just to do like the little highlights, just like we used to do back in the day with the Prisma colors. You know, so you can kind of you get that that sort of pencily look to it. You know, nice. Um, I don't know, man. It, it, you know, it it's good for for quick sketches. I don't usually work this way very often when I'm doing um, finished art. If I was doing finished art, I'd be a little bit more careful about it, and I'd try to get a more watercolory look. So if I if I was using some brushes, I'd probably go in and I I picked up a bunch of brushes online uh, that were kind of cool. But you know, I'd I'd get some brushes that approximated like what real watercolor does, um, right. so you can get some of those hard edges and stuff. Like I only I just was just using a soft brush, but you know, some of these brushes you can get like a I don't know if you can see that. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. You can get more of like a um, a harder edge to it, so they look right. a little more like watercolor. Kind of where the, the the pigment would like kind of pool up against the edge of that water. Yeah, that's right. Right. So you can get you can get some some really interesting looking uh, stuff that looks a little bit more like watercolor. You know, so nice. as you start to go over it, you get that real that real watercolor look. And that's I I try to use that technique a little bit more when I'm doing um, the finished stuff right. uh, for my clients so that it actually looks like a watercolor. Because I don't want something um, in between like this guy is. You know, this guy's sort of like, I don't know what you would call it. Maybe it's like marker, maybe it's pe colored pencil, whatever. Yeah. When I do the finished stuff for somebody else, I tend to try to make it look a little bit more uh, like an actual watercolor. Excellent. So, yeah, so then I think the only thing that I would do at, at this point probably would be to throw on a little bit of a texture and then we can call it a day. Texture, yeah. See, that's the one thing that uh, the digital really lets you do. Yeah, you got to love that stuff. So that's I got them all built into my action, so they come on, you know, you, you can do them really quick and then you get some masks with them. So, And then if you if you use, like, the um, the clipping masks, you can apply them to... You know, to different areas. Right. So I've done something similar with uh, you take like a photograph of an old piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. It onto the artwork and it makes my comic book artwork look like it was drawn back in the '60s, you know, or something like that. But I love that effect, and and that's great when you're doing watercolors, you know, because you can really get some interesting looking stuff going on. Oh, yeah. So then you you know you can take your textures and you can start to change their colors and stuff too, you know. Oh, look at that. So. You can get some really interesting effects. Sometimes there you it's, go. it's kind of fun to get like some, you know, some opposite colors in there, like you wouldn't normally use. Like if you put like a purple or a red on top of a green, you can get some really interesting effects. Yeah. So that kind of looks. It looks a little more like a like a monster skin kind of thing. There. Well, it used to we used to let the paper kind of like create some of those accidents for you. That kind of gives you some interest in there. Yeah, definitely. And yeah. now you kind of have to figure out different ways to do that. But it looks like. Uh, that looks awesome. Yeah, I kind of like the that sort of that modeled look, you know. And sometimes it gets a little dark, so you got to be careful with it. But get the basic idea. Right. Well, it's, yeah. it comes out pretty well over the over the video feed, so. Yeah, not too bad. I I we I talked to you a little bit before about how sometimes it can get a little dark, so I'm trying to just mm -hmm. uh, add color to the textures and then you know lighten them up a little bit so that uh, they they go a little softer than you normally would have them. That way they, you know, like, even though, like, on my monitor, I can barely see this, but when I look at it, um, you know, on the video, it, it's it's a little more pronounced, so. Right. Got to be kind of careful with that stuff. Anyways, well, that rocks. I love your drawing, man. I, I remember that guy vividly. Yeah, well, you know, it's uh, it's one of those ones that just, like, burns into your brain. So that's Mecha Godzilla versus. Regular what was Godzilla. the name of that movie? It was Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla. <laughs> kind of recreated in cartoon form today. So yeah, it's fun. I went from you know sort of being a bad guy to almost being a good guy. You know. Right. Well, here's the thing I want to do. Um, eventually, uh, maybe if anyone does actually watch these, uh, they could they could send some ideas on what what kind of subjects we could do. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. And and you know we've always got a bunch of fun ideas, and they kind of just you know, come at us well, from time thinking, to time. But. Check this out. What we'll do one time is we won't we won't decide beforehand. We'll just show up, and I give you a subject, and then you give me one. Oh, that's great. I love that. And it'll, <laughs> I don't know what we call that, but it'll be like a blind draw. Yeah, so, okay. That's cool. I like that. Let's do that one next time. Okay, deal. All, All right. right, good. All right, so we'll call this one a, a wrap, and I'm just going to head over here, and we'll knock off the uh, the broadcast, and then that'll wrap up.
All right. We'll see you guys in about a week then, I guess. Yeah. All right. Cool.